Welcome to Webster Presbyterian Church on this 4th of July weekend. We are glad that you are worshiping with us and to those who are here right now, we're glad that you are here. For wherever two or more are gathered, God is with us here in this place. Let us worship God this day. I am Mary Lawrence, an elder here at this church, and I am standing in for Keith Uffman, who is with his family this Sunday. And also I'd like to welcome any visitors who are with us today, and we hope that you find this service meaningful and thought-provoking. And please come and introduce yourself to one of the worship leaders after this service so we can greet you personally. And of course, all who may be watching on YouTube, if you have any questions about our church, please call the church secretary and leave a contact number and someone will get in touch with you. This, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And now I have one more announcement, and this is a very, um, very happy one to announce. And we have with us today, and for time, a long time to come, um, the introduction of our new parish associate, Reverend Dr. Richard Kleeman, and his wife, Elsa. So if you would stand so people can see you. There is a letter of introduction that's in the narthex, so you may pick that up and read all about everything that he has done in his career. And, uh, but one thing that I was most impressed about while reading this, and he also hearing wonderful things about him from some colleagues, is about his ability to put people together for a common purpose. He knows how to encourage church growth he was instrumental in uniting First Presbyterian Church and Westminster Presbyterian Church into the Faith Presbyterian Church of Baytown. And eight years later, he was able to bring together First Presbyterian Church of Texas City and Memorial Lutheran into a worshiping community. Richard will be offering the prayers of the people today and preaching next Sunday. And so make him feel welcome in his new church home and wear your name tag, which I am not wearing. Um, <laughs> my bad, but it's over there. And uh, so you can greet him by name and he can learn to learn our names as well. And also um, after church is over, uh, Jennifer has said that there will be coffee in Boughton Hall, Boughton Hall <laughs> today for us to gather for coffee and also to meet and greet Richard and Elsa. And finally, a little bird told me that Richard's birthday is coming up. It's July 5th. So let us show him how glad we are that he is here by joining the choir in a chorus. As we know, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Let us worship God. Join me in the call to worship. Praise be to God who has freed us from oppression. Praise be to God who has healed our wounded souls. Let our hearts rejoice at God's redeeming love. Let our voices be raised in songs of thanksgiving 
for all that God is doing for us. Come, let us worship the Lord with our whole hearts. May our praise and voices resound with joy. Amen. Join me in this litany for our prayer of the day. Almighty God, you rule all the peoples of the earth. Inspire the minds of all women and men to whom you have committed the responsibility of government and leadership in the nations of the world. Lord, hear our prayer. Give to them the vision of truth and justice, that by their counsel all nations and peoples may work together. Give to the people of our country zeal for justice and strength for forbearance, that we may use our liberty in accordance with your gracious will. Lord, hear our prayer. Forgive our shortcomings as a nation. Purify our hearts to see and love the truth. We pray for all these things through Jesus Christ. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. Amen. John 1 tells us if we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God. Eternal God, our judge and redeemer, we confess that we have tried to hide from you, for we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors 
and refuse to bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. In your great mercy, forgive our sins and free us from selfishness that we may choose your will and obey your commandments through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, let us go to God in silent confession. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Hear the good news. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you, we are forgiven. May the God of mercy, who forgives you all your sins and strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Romans, may the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Let us pass the peace. How are you guys? First of all, I want to remind everybody, whose table is this? That's right, God's and Jesus' table. And who is invited to come to this table? Everyone, that is correct. All right, so I wanted to share with you a story today, taken from 2 Kings, about a man named Naaman, who was a very powerful general in the army. But one day, he had a rash on his body, and it was really itchy. It's like he had mosquito bites all over. That would be terrible, wouldn't it? I know, it's terrible. But he didn't have a doctor or a hospital to go to. So he went to the king, and the king said, go to Israel and see if someone can help you. So he packed up his animals. He packed up all his gold and all his silver because he thought this was going to be a a really hard thing he was going to have to do to get rid of this. And he headed to Israel. And while he was on his way... Elisha, the prophet, who is someone who knows about God and talks about God, heard about him and he said, tell him to come see me and I will heal him. So he took all of his animals and all his gold and silver and he went to Elisha's house and Elisha sent out a a servant, a messenger and said, hey, just tell him, go down to the river, bathe seven times and he'll be healed. And you know what? Naaman said, you mean I packed up all of my stuff? all of my clothes, all of my gold and silver because I thought I was going to have to pay somebody. And I traveled all the way over here and he doesn't even come out to see me and he just tells me to go wash in the river. 
I could have done that at home. Why did I come here? And one of the servants that he brought with him said, you know, you would have done something really difficult. If he said you had to go out and do something really hard and difficult, you would have done it. You would have given your gold and silver. He's telling you to do something simple and just go bathe in the water seven times. So after Naaman calmed down, he said, you're right, let me give this a try. So he went down to the river, and he bathed seven times. Count it with me. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And guess what? When he got out of the water, his skin was healed. Isn't that amazing? That is. So after I read this, I started thinking, you know, God tells us to do stuff. And he tells us things like, love everybody. And when I first heard that, I thought, wow, that's really hard to do. But then I started reading, after I read this, I said, you know what? I bet there's some simple things and easy things we could do instead to to show our love to people. Can you think of something? Oh, well, that's true. Sometimes get the hard stuff over with first. But what are some simple ways that we can show people that we love them? Can you think of something that's easy to do, that's simple? You could give them a gift. What about, what about a smile? Do you think that shows that we love them if we give them a, a smile? Or what if we hold the door open for someone? That would be nice. So we can do some simple things, couldn't we? We can. All right, so let's say a prayer. Are you ready? Repeat after me. Dear God, sometimes we make... Following you more difficult than it needs to be. Help us keep it simple. Amen. Thank you so much for coming up here. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Living God, help us to hear your holy word with open hearts so that we may truly understand and understanding that we may believe and believing that we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do through Christ our Lord. Amen. First scripture reading for today is taken from the Psalm 66, verses 1 through 9. Make a joyful noise to the God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Because of your great power, your enemies cringe before you. All the earth worships you. They sing praises to you, sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds among mortals. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There we rejoiced in him who rules by his might forever whose eyes keep watch on the nations and let the rebellious not exalt themselves. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard who has kept us among the living and has not let our foot slip. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Before we sing our anthem this morning, just a quick word about it. You know, this is a day that we talk about things in our American history. We're actually kind of uh, giving a nod here to some of our local history. If you didn't join this, this worshiping community until after 2010, you may not know the name Ken Jones. Ken arranged the, the uh, America that we're, the, the, the anthem America that we're about to sing. Ken is Kim Kinsler's father, and he and his wife Jenny were stalwarts of our music ministry here at Webster Presbyterian Church.
Ken filled in sometimes for me, sometimes for the organist. He wrote many arrangements for choir, handbells, played in those groups and sang in those groups, uh, recorders, guitar. What else, Kim? <laughs> Xylophone. I don't know, whatever. He, if, if there was a musical instrument, Ken, Ken could figure it out. And um, so um, this is America arranged by Ken Jones. Thank you, choir. That was, that was just beautiful and uh, really reminds me of the ideals of our nation and what we strive to be. Our second reading today is taken from Paul's, letters to the, to Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 6, verses 1 through 16. My brothers and sisters, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should, restu should restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think that they are something, they deceive themselves. 
all must test their own work, then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride, for all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the community of faith. See what large letters I make when I am writing in my own hand? It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who try to compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Even the circumcised do not themselves obey the law, but they want you to be circumcised so that you may boast about your flesh. May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For, new, for neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation. A new creation is everything. As for those who follow this rule, peace be upon them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I suppose there are many reasons why people write letters. Years ago, when I was in college, and away from home for the first time, it was because long-distance phone calls were quite expensive. And I still have many of the letters that my parents wrote to me during my college years. Most were what I would call newsy, but there were some that would definitely come under the heading of parental advice. How I should learn how to keep my cool. That possibly I might learn more by listening rather than talking. And always, to remember to enjoy college life, take it to its fullest, but don't forget to study. <laughs> I realize that letter writing is almost becoming a lost art, but there was a time when letter writing was a more common and a very effective means to communicate across the miles. And that is what Paul was doing in his letters to the various churches he established during his missionary travels. Paul would start different churches, but there came a time after they were established when he would have to move on. And so, when his physical presence with them was not possible, Paul's alternative was to write letters to the churches, to encourage the people or chastise them, to explain some theological point or to correct some questionable teaching that was going on in a particular church. The early days of the church were a time of growth and movement, which is a good thing. But different opinions can often lead to conflict and unsettledness. And in such situations, Paul would write these letters and provide some practical suggestions and everyday advice for what it means to live in this new community of faith. And such was the case with the church in Galatia. His letters to that church opens for us a window to a controversy surrounding the expansion of the Christian movement into the Gentile communities in the ancient Mediterranean world. Were these mission churches to be understood as branches on the tree of Judaism? Or were they to be understood as a new and a distinctive community? 
Were the Gentile converts expected to accept Jewish practices and values? Or were they free to keep their former ways of life? By the middle of the first century, the debate and the struggle over these questions turned into open conflict. And so this letter to the Galatians should not be viewed solely as a general theological discourse, but rather as an urgent pastoral letter written to a particular group of churches who found themselves in a crisis moment and providing an example for them of how to think theologically about challenges facing the life of a community of faith. Now, in the early chapters in Galatians, the people appear to have heard and accepted Paul's message joyfully. As at one point he wrote, you did not scorn or despise me, but welcomed me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. And after Paul left, he felt confident that the churches were running well. But it didn't stay that way. For at the time Paul wrote the letter, he had received word that his work was being undermined by Jewish Christian missionaries who had arrived and preached a different message and tried to persuade the Gentile Galatians to be circumcised. This infuriated Paul, and he wrote a letter to advise against it, calling it a perversion of the gospel. So why was P F Paul finding this message and teaching objectionable? First, the missionaries placed the emphasis on circumcision and observing the law as conditional grounds for belonging. For Paul, this was counter to the gospel of God's grace shown in the death of Jesus for the cross, not the law, Paul said, is the basis of our relationship with God. Secondly, it is through this power of God's spirit that guides the life of the faithful. faithful. For Paul strongly believed that where God's spirit has been poured out on the church, there was no need for written laws or rules to control the community. All that is needed to keep the community in check is to follow the life-giving spirit of God. Another objection for Paul was that God's reconciling power does not come about by forcing one group of believers to become like another group of believers, but by bringing all believers together at a common table. For Paul, Jesus' death on the cross changed the world in a way that nothing else ever did or ever would. Jesus' death transformed the world for all times. And what these missionaries were teaching was a betrayal of that gospel, a move back to life under the law, a move before Christ came to set us free. Today's text provides guidance and advice and very importantly, practices for what it means for a community to walk together by the Spirit into this new creation, a new creation brought about by the singular transformative event of Jesus' death on the cross. In the closing verses of today's text, Paul writes, for neither circumcision or uncircumcision is anything but but a new creation is everything. This new creation that Paul speaks to is not an integration of two groups, but a new way for all God's people to live together. It's not that circumcision does not save while non-circumcision does. It's that neither will save you. This new way of being transcends either or categories. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you, all of us, 
are one in Christ Jesus. Made right with God by faith, we are set free to be and to live in this new distinction-free form of life. But how? Living in this new creation is in Christ is living the life of love. And Paul gives us several insights on living the life of love in this new creation. The first is forgiveness. My brothers and sisters, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. And how this is done is important because condemning someone for his or her actions but doing nothing else is simply reactionary. All we are doing is responding in kind to some offense. Such behavior on the part of both parties does not do anything, does not do anything to further this new creation, this new way for all God's people to live together. It only serves to separate and divide. And condoning disruptive and divisive behavior is lazy. When we condone such behavior by ignoring it or avoiding it because we don't want to upset someone or something, we're avoiding the difficult task of correction and restoration, restoration into right relationship. But forgiveness, forgiveness is an extraordinarily creative act because it brings people or groups of people into that new relationship. One that acknowledges the reality of the brokenness of the relationship and the damage that the brokenness caused, but yet is still able to forge a new path where all parties can move forward. Second way is mutuality. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. This is faith working through love. At times, we are the friend who helps, and at other times, we are the ones who are helped. And this is, there is a mutuality of giving and receiving as we help and are helped. And now this is something that this particular community of faith does quite well. And I personally have experienced firsthand your faith working through love. Love showed in food and cards and letters and texts and phone calls and visits in my own life during this past year. And I am so very grateful and humbled by that. Now, Paul is very concerned and interested in the doing of good works, in the living out of the command that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We are here to assist one another and not judge. We are here to help the person carrying the weight of too heavy a burden. We are free to bend, to help those who have fallen, but we are not free to decide who is worthy of help and who is not. And none of this is easy work. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer attests to in Life Together, his account of a unique fellowship in an underground seminary during the Nazi years in Germany, he gives practical advice on how life together in Christ can be sustained in families and in groups. In the section on the ministry of bearing, Bonhoeffer writes, the freedom of the other person includes all that we mean by a person's nature, individuality, endowment. It also includes his weaknesses and oddities, which are such a trial to our patience. Everything that produces friction, conflicts, and collisions among us. To bear the burden of the other person 
means tolerating the created reality of the other, to accept and to affirm it, and in bearing with it, to break through to the point where we take joy in it. And this is possible because, as he writes later, he who is bearing others knows that he himself is being born by others too. And only in this strength can he go on bearing. We can bear the burdens of others even as we ourselves are being born by others. And in the end, what matters is this. How will we live together in this new creation? This new creation that Paul speaks of, this new creation that we inhabit still today. And it's not just how we live together here at Webster, but how we live together within our families, within our communities, within our nation, within our world, and within our cosmos. Each of us and all of us live in the shelter of one another. And no matter how hard we may try, we cannot escape that. But the good news, the good news is that scripture provides us with direction for what to do and how to live. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Let love prevail in your life, your words and actions. He has told you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Now there is a cost to bearing one another's burdens. It takes work. But not bearing one another's burdens costs more. Life together can be fraught with difficulties. We all know that. And Paul never said bearing another's burdens would be easy. Because if it were, more people would love their neighbors as themselves. More people would love kindness. More people would do justice. And more people would walk humbly with God. But this, this I do believe. Compassion will prevail. Hope will prevail. Grace, grace will prevail. And love, love will prevail. Amen. And today's invitation to discipleship is timely. <laughs> do to others as you would have them do to you. Please stand as we join together and say what we believe using the version of the Apostles' Creed found in your bulletin. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, we believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, you beautiful, wonderful people of God. You're a good-looking congregation. Did you know that? And I'm so grateful to be starting this journey uh, with you today. And as uh, Mary said in her sermon, working in faith together through love, um, your outpouring of love for our family over the last three months has been absolutely astounding. And I just personally want to thank you for your prayers, for our grandson James, uh, for his mama, Caroline, his daddy, Matt, for our entire uh, family. We've been so grateful as you have lifted up uh, this family in prayers. So let's, uh, let's join together in prayer. What is prayer? It's basically a conversation, isn't it? But I always believe that prayer starts in deep silence because silence is God's first language. And sometimes we think we'll be heard in our prayers for our many words. Jesus said contrary, didn't he? Uh, Jesus said, go into the closet, shut the door, and pray. And I've always found that to be interesting since uh, if you know anything about first century uh, architecture, uh, they didn't have closets. So what was Jesus talking about? The inner self. That's where we start with prayer opening our hearts, minds, our souls to all that God has for us. So join me in prayer, and we begin in silence. Let us pray. Gracious God of perfect love, you continually bring forth life, transforming sadness into joy and despair into hope. We are weak, but you are strong. Our ways are flawed, but your ways are true. We are seldom right, but you are never wrong. In humility and boldness, we come before you interceding on behalf of others. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We pray for the church. Make us faithful laborers in your harvest. Provide what we need to do to do your work and send us out with a message of hope for all. We ask that you would grant wisdom to the 225th General Assembly Commissioners as they seek to listen to the movement of the Holy Spirit, leading us as your people into the future. O oh, gracious God, hear our prayer. And so we pray for the world. Look with compassion and healing at the pain and brokenness of our world. We remember before you the Ukrainians. Bring peace to their land and their country. Cover your creation with mercy and peace. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We pray for this community, for our nation, As we remember and give thanks for the work and vision of our forebears, help us to seek justice and freedom for all. We give thanks for our country, our nation of freedom, asking that your Holy Spirit would mend political divisions, granting us the ability to live in love and peace 
serving our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, gracious God, hear our prayer. We pray for loved ones. Let your healing touch rest upon those who are struggling and suffering this day. Restore their health and strength. Give them whatever it is that they need in these moments to simply put one foot in front of the other, living in your abundant and gracious presence. O oh, gracious God, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, our God, we give you thanks for the grace that is at work in us through the gift of our baptism, the sign of your threefold name, the communion of your faithful people, the promise of your glorious realm. By the power of your Holy Spirit poured out upon us in baptism, let your grace and peace grow in us until we gather at your heavenly throne to give you thanks and praise forever. All this we ask of you, Lord God, through Jesus Christ, our Savior, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And let all the people say, Amen. For our call to stewardship. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship.
Please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. You will note it's not what we usually say. This one has been adapted by Reese, Reese Terry, correct? By Reese Terry, one of, our, one of our members. So please join me. Dear Lord God of the universe and galaxies, we need your help in bringing our societies nearer your heavenly example. We on earth seem to be drifting apart. Please help us to become more like your heaven. Give us our daily nourishment for body and soul. Forgive us for our worldly desires and mistakes as we forgive those who have wronged us. Guide us along the path of goodness and light and away from the paths leading to darkness, danger, and evil. For yours is the heavenly kingdom, your power over all the universe, and your infinite heavenly glory. Amen.
Please be seated for the charge and the blessing and remain seated for the postlude and reminder afterwards you can go to Bounton Hall to have coffee and greet Richard and Elsa. So glad that you're here with us today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.